Thank you, and thank you all. Now, this doesn't look like much. It certainly doesn't look like a great invention, does it? Uh, but it is. In fact, in 2008, this was voted or named uh, the top invention of the year um, by Time magazine. And so what is it? It is the personal gene profile, the personal uh, genome scan. And what happens here is that you have that little cup with a tube, and you basically spit in it. You send it to a genomics company. There's no doctor involved here. And they make a test of a million different genetic variations or mutations that you have in your six billion um, DNA bases um, of genome. And this, of course, can tell you about your ancestry, where your uh, really early ancestors came from, how they migrated through the world out of Africa. It can tell you about disease risks for a lot of diseases. And ultimately, it will be able to tell you about the basis for your personality, your different psychological disorders. What do I know? Um, and what is happening here is really what this guy, Steven Pinker, a psychologist from Harvard, said uh, last year in a big essay he had in the New York Times, he said, we are entering the age of personal genomics. Now, that also doesn't exactly sound like much. It sounds almost innocuous. Um, consumer genomics, personal genomics, what does that mean? Well, it is really a momentous development. Uh, what we're seeing is biology's big parallel to the PC revolution. Because if you think about it, what happened with the computer revolution? Computers used to be big, hugely expensive machines that were only found in research institutions, a few uh, universities here and there, a few big companies, and only experts got to relate to these computers and use them. Um, I think there was even a director of IBM who said there wasn't really a market for personal computers. Well, what happened, as we all know, was that the price of the technology dropped so dramatically that we got the PC. Um, this is an early model. Um, and of course, with the PC, suddenly uh, there was a revolution going on. We all got access to handling information uh, on computers. We've seen a tremendous development both in our social interactions, the way we run our societies, uh, freedom of information, everything. Yeah, back to WikiLeaks this week, for example. Um, so this was a big revolution that changed our lives, basically. And so what we're seeing when genomics is now moving out of the labs, it used to be that only experts who had studied genetics, who could really uh, you know, work with genetics, and they could do it in labs. It used to be really, really expensive. If you go back to the uh, mapping of the human genome, which came out in 2001, that, had taken, that project had taken hundreds, thousands of researchers, almost 15 years and cost $40 billion or something like that. Hugely expensive. Now, uh, the prophecy is that within probably a couple, maybe three years, you can get your full genome sequenced and mapped for $1,000. Now, of course, the products as they are today, um, the genome scans that was named the, um, the invention of the year two years ago, is one of these products, a first generation product. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how, that, how it works. Because I was, um, I'm of a certain age, I'm of a generation that was kind of left behind in the computer revolution. I never really got to be friends with my computer. I use it, but I don't really like it. I always have to have my boyfriend, you know, install new things, stuff like that. So I'm partly computer illiterate, I was left behind. Anyway, I decided I didn't want to be left behind this revolution, the personal genomics revolution, the PG revolution. So what I did was, as soon as the uh, personal genome profile became commercially available, I got out and got myself um, a personal uh, genome test. So what I did was I went to an Icelandic company. There are like three, four, five companies now. Uh, but these guys... Um, did reasonably good um, genetics research, so I chose this company. I asked for a test kit, it looks kind of like the one you saw before, and I, um, I didn't have to spit, I scraped the inside of my cheek, I sent it back, 
And in two weeks, what I got was an email saying, now your personal um, gene scan is, is ready. You can go and see the results. You can go and see your risk for uh, about 50 different conditions. And you can go and see your ancestry, what your ethnic mix is, and, and so on. And as you see, this is pretty much like a Facebook world, almost. You can actually link, you can't see it here, but you can link these genetic test results to your Facebook account. And on the company's website, where you, of course, have your own little personal page, like on Facebook, you can go and um, compare your genes to the genes of, say, James Watson, the co-discoverer of, of DNA, um, an old guy today, 80-something, uh, or Craig Venter, who was very much involved in the Human Genome Project, or all sorts of other people who just, you know, ask you, would you like to be my friend? Could we compare our genomes? Oh, sure, sure, no problem. And uh, so uh, I found out, by the way, that uh, I have very little in common with uh, uh, James Watson, more in common with Craig Venter. I don't know what that says about me. Um, anyway, um, of course, the, the more, this is like the, the, you could call it the entertaining bit. Uh, then, of course, the more serious part is about the diseases, your disease risks, which is what these tests are uh, pretty much sold on. I mean, you can go and get uh, a sense of what your um, risk for 50 diseases are, for example. Um, and I have to say, when I got this uh, and I sat there in a cold hotel room in Reykjavik where I had gone to talk about this with the founders of, of the company, I was a little bit nervous. It was very strange suddenly to have this almost, it feels like I'm going to now have this prophecy about how my life is going to turn out, what, what I'm going to die from, what diseases I'm going to get. Um, but you go in, one disease at a time, and you accept you know, the conditions, um, you want to get this information or you don't want to get this information. So informed consent today is really clicking yes or no. So um, for example, Alzheimer's disease, that is like one of the diseases I would really not like to have. And there are genetic variations that they test here that will give you a very high risk for Alzheimer's. So that was, I was, my hand was shaking when I clicked yes there. But as you see, the average, that means most of you will have 12% risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. I only have 6.7. Nice. Um, on the other hand, basal cell carcinoma, which is skin cancer, uh, most of you will have 25% risk in your lifetime. I have almost 43. Not so nice. And you can go through all of these from heart disease to different cancers to even gout. Uh, and stuff like that. And it is, I have to say, the first time you do it, like the first kind, uh, couple of diseases, it's kind of nerve-wracking. But then you get into it, and you want to read more about, I mean, you can, of course, go in and you can see what is the background for all these calculations. How do they calculate this? And what genes are involved? What are the different genetic variations that will give you these different risks? And it becomes, I think, very exciting in a way. It, it feels like sort of getting in close contact with a part of your biology that has always been really only an abstraction. It becomes much more concrete suddenly. You can read about what are these genes? What do they do in my body? What kind of proteins do they produce? And what happens? And why does it lead to, say, bladder cancer or something else? And of course, there is a lot of debate surrounding these tests. And a country like Germany, for example, has already forbidden people like you and me to take these tests without a doctor being involved and a doctor prescribing it. And this is what you will hear from a lot of doctors and certainly a lot of bioethicists. They will say that basically ordinary people like you and me uh, are not equipped to understand this. So we should have a genetic counselor present, or we should have a doctor present to explain all this to us. I have to say, well, I have a background as a biologist, but I have discussed this with many people who haven't anything but, you know, high school education. And I think it is pretty much as one of the scientists I've spoken to said, well, if people can understand baseball statistics, they can certainly understand basic genetics. It isn't that hard. 
Um, because what we're talking about here is a very simple genetic code, a very simple digital information. Um, and so the other question, of course, becomes how does it how does it affect your life? Because what these ethicists and doctors will tell you, um, the way this will affect your life, because you're not equipped to really understand these risks, is that you will become nervous, you will think about your disease risks all the time, you will go to the doctor a lot of the time, and you will, um, you will be a pain in the butt to the healthcare system. So all in all, a very bad deal. I would beg to differ. Actually, if you look at it, the first studies that are starting to come out um, where scientists are looking into, so what do people actually do when they have these, te these tests? How does it affect their lives? Do they become more nervous? Do they go to the doctor a lot? It seems not. On the other hand, it seems that people who go in and take a test like this is because they're, of course, interested in knowing these risks, and what they do is they go in, they see, okay, do I have a very high risk of, say, heart disease, for example, so maybe I should not smoke anymore. Maybe I should get, you know, some tests from the doctor, see if the cholesterol is okay, so on. What I would say is that, you know, basal cell carcinoma, very high risk, yeah. I should probably stay out of the sun or at least put sunscreen on. I should probably look at any weird spots I get and go to the doctor. I don't go around thinking, oh my god, I'm going to get skin cancer. Um, in fact, what I really felt after seeing all these different risks, and a lot of them are you know, higher than average, some are lower, um, is that I just became very, very interested in getting more information. It's like getting, you know, you're sinking your teeth into something and you become really interested in your own biology. And what is great about this test where you have the raw data from a million different genetic mutations, they can tell you much more than the company tells you. Because a couple of guys um, in the open source uh, Wikipedia environment have, have made this great program called Prometheus, where you can take your raw data, send it to their server, and what the server does is take all the genetic research that is out there and gather it together and see what does it say about your genetic variations. So, and this is of course a program that is updated all the time. So every, every week, every new study that has been made that mentions genetic variations will come into this and be part of it. So you can update your report and basically become part of ongoing research which feels like really, really exciting when you think about it. I mean, it becomes, you connect directly to what people are doing in the labs. Instead of just you know, reading in a newspaper that somebody found something out by looking at a group of Harvard students. Fine, but you can go in immediately when you read a study like that and test, so where does that place me? What does that say about my genetic inheritance? And when I first did this report, I sent it to one of the guys <clears throat> who created the program. And he looked over it, and immediately he sent me an email back saying, wow, you are the first one I have seen um, with you know, an RS81773 whatever in a double doses. That's great. And I went in and I said, yeah, that really is great, because that's a mutation that I have in a, a double dose of it. And what it does is, in fact, it seems to protect against blood poisoning, bacteremia, uh, against malaria and tuberculosis. That's a nice one. Um, and I went through it with one of my friends sitting next to me, actually. Um, and just to give you an impression of the variety and breadth of research out there, we stumbled upon this other genetic variation that I also have in a double dose. And it's a genetic variation that, it turns out, if women have this variant and they also drink more than three cups of coffee a day, they will have significantly smaller breasts. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I admit, I do drink a lot of coffee. And as my friend said, uh, my male friend said, they should ban coffee for young women. 
it's dangerous. So, um, but all in all, what I want to say with this is that you get into this mode of really getting interested in your biology. You don't just take it as a test and see, okay, I have this risk or that risk. You feel sort of, um, you begin to feel the miracle of biology and get close to it in a way that you never can from just, you know, reading a book on biology. Um, but going into this, looking at it, and delving into the articles behind it, um, it's just completely fascinating. It feels like exploring yourself from an angle you never had access to before. Um, and I would say that it really sort of, it makes you feel very much at home in your biology. Um, it makes you realize that we are not this classical dualistic um, being that is partly biological and then there's something else, this mysterious soul that isn't biological. No, we are really, really biological miracles. And everything about us comes out of this biology. Our, even our social interactions, everything, our uh, culture grows from this biology and exploring it from the basic genetic uh, digital information is just completely fascinating. And this, I think, will make us, you know, the more people who get intimate with their genetic information, um, the more we will have a sort of biological view of human beings that I think will be very healthy for society. Now, this is sort of the private part of it or the, um, the personal part of it. If you look at a more <clears throat> sort of at a philosophical level, how can this change the way that we look at human beings and at life. I think it is very significant that the more we get into genetics, the more we realize again that the basis of life itself as a phenomenon is not, it is not a, you know, a substance, it's not a chemical entity, it's really information, digital information. And of course this opens, I think, um, this opens the door to a different way of looking at life as a phenomenon. Because if you think about it, this information started, let's say it was constructed the first time, um, say five billion years ago, when life began. And from there, this information has mutated, developed, and been, car been carried along by organisms up till now. And so we're the organisms who are here today. We're gonna pass on the same miraculous information that is on the one hand, so simple, four letters, and on the other hand, it gives sort of the basis for beings like ourselves. So what we are realizing, I think, is that we should look at life as really a river or flood of information that goes through time, and each of us is sort of a temporary vessel for this information. We're just carrying it maybe passing it on, and it was passed on to us. I think that is a very satisfying way of looking at life. And, of course, that also questions um, the way that we should treat this information. Because, of course, the more we get, the more we get genetic information into the mainstream, and um, the more people who get their hands on genetic information, the more there is the discussion about, so how do we treat it in society? And I have to say, um, I think that when you look at the old, the old way of looking at it, the more traditional way is to say that um, genetic information is so very, very personal, um, that it should be highly guarded, it should be kept, you know, um, within boundaries, it sh there should be genetic privacy, basically. And this is talked about a lot, genetic privacy is enormously important, people will tell you. And I think this is uh, a way of looking at it from before the PG revolution, from when, you know, genetic information was sort of very abstract to people, and we knew very little about it. Nobody had their hands on it. But if we are indeed these temporary vessels for this information, I think it's uh, fair to say that 
it doesn't really belong to us as individuals. What belongs to me is, of course, my body, my individual organism, but the information that sort of, you know, is harbored in this uh, body, in this organism, was given to me by somebody. I can pass it on or I cannot pass it on. And this is the same for everyone. So the information, I think, is not mine or yours. It's the property, the common property of humankind. And that's the way we should use it. Uh, we should not guard genetic privacy because this information is not who we are. It's not our essence. It's a basis for who we are, but I'll come back to that. And actually, I think what is interesting is that there is already a movement that is about um, genomic openness and open source genetics. And this guy, um, James Watson, co-discoverer of um, structure of DNA, has already has had his whole genome sequenced, mapped, and he chose to place it on the web. It's on the web. You can go and look at what is the uh, sort of digital basis of James Watson. And I think this is the way to go about it. As much as we can, we should have you know, our genomes on the web. Another very interesting project um, is from this group, or rather, these 10 people are uh, the 10 pioneers of what is called the Personal Genome Project. It is uh, the brainchild of the gentleman in the middle, PGP1, George Church, who's a Harvard geneticist, and who had this vision of, let's get together 100,000 volunteers who will volunteer you know, to have their genomes completely mapped, completely sequenced, put on the web, and not only that, but put on the web with their pictures, their names, their medical records, and even, I think, tests of their IQ uh, and personality and brain images and so on. Now, what is the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to get a huge information database that anyone can access and do research on, not just professional geneticists, but anyone with a computer who can go into this database, try to figure out new um, you know, connections between genetic variants and actual human traits, because you have all the information there. What does this person eat? What kind of um, diseases does he have? Uh, and what kind of genetic variants? So this would create an enormous database for basically everyone. And as Church has said himself, we don't know who the innovators of tomorrow are. I mean, if you look at the PC revolution again, people you didn't know anything about, you know, boys would sit in a garage somewhere and come out with companies that would grow to be huge. And the same thing here, it could be a 16-year-old girl sitting somewhere finding a great idea for a research project or for a new product and coming out with that because of this open genomics. And again, within two or three years, um, we can all basically join this and have our genome sequenced for probably $1,000 uh, and put it out there. And this is the beginning of an era where we can really get at what is the holy grail for genetics research, which is understanding how our genes combine with our environment and make us who we are. And this is also, I think, the death of genetic determinism. Because we used to say, or a lot of people still think, that if something is genetic, it's predestined. You have a gene for this, so you will get this or be like that. But it turns out, the more research we do, that our genome is not a straitjacket. What it actually is, is a nice soft sweater that you can shape and form. Our genome is a very dynamic structure. And so, of course, this development is very new, and it raises a ton of questions, a ton more questions that I could answer or even pose in 18 minutes, but I want to leave you with the most important one, which is, how will you take part in the PGA revolution? Thank you.